Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Welcome back to Dragoon Week, and today we're talking about World War I use of the Bosin-Nagant Dragoon Rifles. Now, there's a lot to get into when we talk about this, and we're not going to cover everything there is to talk about. We're just going to cover some of the highlights. Just a few noteworthy things, because honestly, we could have a whole series just talking about the use of the Mosin rifle in World War I, because it was used everywhere in places you probably didn't realize, as we're going to see in this video. But to start out, we're first going to be talking about some more, I guess, expected or typical use cases for the Dragoon rifle. And obviously it would have been used by Dragoon troops. Of course, these guys would have been uh, infantry troops that would have been on the front line just like anybody else, but they would have been on horseback and they would have had cavalry sabers and some other things. A lot of times we actually see pictures of them with these massive tall lances almost that almost look medieval because they, they really are. Um, you would still have uh, cavalry charges in World War I. It, in varying degrees of effect, but it was widely used, especially by the Russians. I think a lot of people would probably say the Russians had the best cavalry force in World War I. Maybe not everybody, but I certainly would tend to think that, especially when we start to include people like the Cossacks, just, just crazy people, but um, crazy in a good way, unless you're the enemy. But uh, anyway, we're talking about a lot of interesting cavalry troops here using these rifles. And remember, these, while on horseback, um, typically when we think of like American cowboys, we think of their like lever action rifles. They have these nice leather scabbards on their horse that you would actually put the rifle in. And so the rifle would not be on you, it'd be on a scabbard on your horse. We don't really see that with dragoons in World War I. Instead, we see them with these rifles mounted uh, using a sling on their back. But remember, these had bayonets, so the bayonets would have actually gone on a uh, side holder on their scabbard for their sabers. Okay, so they had a lot going on here. They had sabers, they had mosins, bayonets, They some of them had lances, all this stuff. But even the guys with lances um, had different use cases for them. They weren't just for cavalry charging. One of the nice things is if you're on horseback, right, and if you have a, a really long lance, if you hold that up really high, you can get that rascal pretty high in the air because it's really tall and you're already on horseback. So why is this important? Well, a lot of guys seem to use this for things like such as sabotaging uh, telegraph lines. Remember, telegraph was still uh, used throughout World War I, and you had lines going across all sorts of places of Eastern Europe, and especially by uh, uh, rail, uh, I guess, train tracks, as we kind of talked about in the last video. But it was interestingly enough, in our last video, we talked about rail, rail, a railway brigade, that's hard to say, that used these rifles that were probably in charge of construction and repair of railroad tracks and telegraph lines. But some guys on, that were actually on horseback that we would generally more consider actual Dragoon troops used these rifles to, uh, well not these, not necessarily these rifles, but in some cases, but used uh, these lances that had wire cutters attached to them to, instead of repairing telegraph lines, to actually disable them. Okay, now why would they have done that? Well, think of it, if you're cavalry, you're gonna have a lot better maneuvering and speed capabilities than you would if you were just, you know, standard infantry units. So if you wanted to be the type of a saboteur that would kind of be able to flank the enemy, maybe get through a weak spot in their lines quickly, maybe at night or something, and then start to cut their telegraph lines and then quickly escape, a really good way to do that was potentially for a uh, horse-mounted infantry like Dragoons to do that. And so, as you can see in uh, pictures like this, right, you have guys on horseback with the lances and wire cutters attached to the end of the lances reaching all the way up 
and cutting the lines. And again, you're on horseback, you get extra reach. So there's a lot of benefits to having saboteurs on te for telegraph lines using, uh, utilizing Dragoon troops, essentially. Really interesting stuff. And in fact, we've looked at wire cutters like this before on the channel. So if you haven't already, go check out that video because they're really fascinating. Now, sometimes we would see the, the wire cutters mounted on these like lances or just long poles. And sometimes we'd actually see them mounted at the end of the rifle itself. Uh, in that case, you could use the rifle and hold up the rifle like this to cut the lines, or you could also hold it down to cut things like barbed wire on the ground. A lot of stuff you can do with wire cutters. Uh, none of it's good for the enemy, generally speaking. Um, so that's a really interesting use case of Dragoon troops and potentially these rifles. Okay. So we know that we have mounted infantry on horseback using these Dragoon rifles because they're a little bit shorter than the standard M91 rifles. So they're handier, they're shorter, and they're going to weigh a little bit less as well. These are all good things, especially if you're a, the more mobile type of troop. The less weight, the more handy it can be, the better. But what about some other people that use these rifles that weren't necessarily Dragoon troops? Well, that's a good question. And here's a really interesting thing we're going to talk about today. Have you ever heard of a Russian warship called the Askold? That thing. Uh, what is that? And why are we talking about ships now? Well, this is a really interesting ship. It was actually stationed after the... It was used in the Russo-Japanese War. But after that, it was actually stationed in the Mediterranean area. And little known fact, it actually assisted the, uh, the British and the Australians in the uh, troop landings at Gallipoli. That's right, Russian warship at Gallipoli. Really interesting stuff. Well, we're talking about this today because there's an interesting picture of a sailor on this particular ship. This was taken around, I think, 1916 or 1917. It was actually taken in a town called Toulon in France. That's right, this ship actually docked in France for repairs. Because remember, there's a big alliance between France and Russia in World War I. I mean, they were basically the original allies in World War I. You know, people like uh, Britain and, you know, the United States and everyone else would come in later. But really, it, the, on, the Entente was originally basically just France and uh, Russia. Those were the main powers. So we had this big alliance, and the alliance goes, the alliance between France and Russia goes back further than that. We'll have to talk about that another day. But it's interesting to see a warship in France. Now, why is this interesting? Well, take a closer look at this uh, soldier, or I guess this sailor. You actually notice that whenever this was taken, 1916 or 1917, he actually is holding a Dragoon rifle. I think it would be very hard to make an argument that this uh, sailor is actually a Dragoon. I kind of doubt it. He's a sailor, probably doesn't have a horse. So why would he have a Dragoon rifle? Well, that's pretty interesting and it's a good question, but Realistically, they needed some sort of trained ice infantry, if you would call that, in case they had to, you know, make some emergency, uh, I guess, landing. They just needed uh, capable troops to uh, defend the ship in whatever scenario they faced, whether that be land or sea. They needed to be, have troops trained with rifles. Again, dragoons are a little bit nicer because a ship, you can have really tight quarters and small corridors. Having a little smaller rifle is a lot better than having the M91 rifle. It's shorter, it's more compact, it doesn't weigh as much. So it does seem that in fact sailors use Dragoon rifles as well. Now, I don't know if this was like the official rifle adopted by the Russian Navy. Uh, certainly they probably used other rifles as well, maybe even M91 rifles. Historically, the Russian Navy kind of adopted arms separately from the Russian uh, army. So it's really hard to say exactly 
the, all the different types of weapons that they had, but they certainly, from this picture we can tell, had dragoon rifles. Really interesting. So you never know where a rifle like this was actually used. Really fascinating, folks. Okay, so we've got actual dragoon troops. We've got, uh, well, railway infantry, railway workers, however you want to call them. We have sailors in the Russian Navy. Who else? Well, this is where things start to get really interesting. Because now we're actually going to refocus on a woman. That's right, we're going to talk about a woman today by the name of Maria Bachkareva. Okay. Now, this is a really important woman that you or woman that you may not have heard of before. And why are we talking about a woman? Well, this woman uh, named Maria was really had a fascinating story. She was born, I think, around 1889, and she spent a lot of time in her early years in Siberia. Now, when we talk about Siberia, in order to live in Siberia in, let's say, the early 1900s, you couldn't be what we would call, um, what's the word, weak. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, weak. Uh, most people in the West in modern society today just just far too weak and, I guess, privileged with all of our modern pleasures to really be able to sustain themselves in an environment like this. Uh, but she, of course, and many other people in that time were able to because that's where they were born. That's where they really had to live. If they wanted to survive, they had to work with their environment and it, what an environment it was. Well, unfortunately, she had a pretty uh, tough early life. She was abused by many different men and even uh, tried committing suicide just to end it all by drinking poison, which is... Ugh. She had a rough life, but um, she didn't die. She ended up getting past that, and then she sort of got married. It's kind of weird how the definitions worked back then. It seemed like it wasn't necessarily an official marriage, sort of like maybe what we would today call a common law marriage. I'm not really sure, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak too much of it, but she was sort of married, we'll just say that, to a man, and unfortunately, war was declared right a little afterwards in 1914. Now, I don't know how uh, generally the women's reaction in Russia and Siberia was to this, but there is, uh, it seems like there was a huge wave of patriotism originally that came across the, all of the Russian Empire, essentially. Uh, didn't last, but it, it was there when the war started. And in fact, she insisted on uh, enlisting in the Russian army as an infantry troop on the front lines of battle. That's what she wanted to do. Uh, she had a pretty tough life, so, you know, she, <laughs> she was probably cut out for it just because of what she went through and where she had to live and all of that stuff. But uh, there was only one problem is she was a woman. And it was actually illegal for women to serve in the, uh, really in the army in that sort of role uh, in the Russian Empire in 1914. So she ended up going through some uh, uh, army officers and actually had a telegram sent to the Tsar himself requesting permission to serve in the Russian army. That permission was granted by the Tsar to, uh, I guess the flabbergasment of her mother wasn't too happy about that, right? Uh, if your daughter's going off to war, that's, back in those days, eh, that's not normal, right? Uh, but she did, and she had a tough life there as well. She was actually wounded, and she, she was, became very, uh, really famous, actually, among many people there. She had medals. Um, but unfortunately, around the time 1917, the, the state of the Russian army got pretty terrible, well, even in 1916, uh, kind of on the tail end, um, the morale of the Russian army just w went way down into the toilet, just just went way down. And they, they basically were under the impressions that they were just being used as cannon fodder, right? And they're just sending more and more guys to the front to be killed for really no purpose that they can see. And it seems like they're uh, the troops' perspective is that their uh, officers and leadership just didn't really care about them. So this started leading to a lot of problems, and ultimately, of course, the Russian Revolution. We would see the same thing in France with some mutinies there. Not 
quite the same thing, certainly not the same outcome, but there was, this was not a, uh, this was not a singular uh, thing in history in specific to Russia with uh, this loss of morale of the troops. Okay. Well, the, uh, by this time, though, in 1917, the, uh, the Tsar actually had abdicated. And then we see the provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky come around. And Kerensky had a big problem on his hands, right? Because you're trying to, you're trying to manage the Russian Empire without the whole entire government just imploding on itself, which it kind of, kind of did, and all sorts of horrible things happened. But he was trying to prevent this, and at the same time prevent the army from also collapsing, from just morale loss and people just saying, no, I quit, we're not going to take orders, you tell us we're going to go, you know, over the top, no, we're not going to do it. How do you get around this problem? Well, interestingly, Maria actually suggested the way to combat this loss of morale in the troops and to provide leadership with them again to get them to fight the Hun would be to form a women's battalion of death. That's right, that was actually what she called it, a women's battalion of death. That sounds like a pretty gnarly name for a unit. And it was. This was a... And she she decided that she was going to be the leader of this. And she proposed it, and they said, yes, we're going to allow this to happen, which was kind of amazing. So she ended up... Uh, she was allowed to enlist people. They enlisted about 2,000 women into this role. And what happened after that? Well, we're going to have to save what happened for this for another video, but there may be some people may think that this Women's Battalion of Death was a part of uh, the Leninist communist regime, because as we saw in the Soviet Union, there is a lot of I don't know. There's a lot of people that say there is a lot of women empowerment and things like that. I mean, they le they had, for a time, they were actually one of the first countries in the world to legalize abortion and things like that. And we see a lot of women and work in, like, factories and also in World War II on the front as well, much more so than a lot of other countries. So some people may confuse that with this. This is actually not part of the whole communist Leninist regime. This came before that, right? This is part of Kerensky, before Lenin really took over power. And it, it, Maria didn't really, uh, didn't really like the communist, actually. Uh, she was actually vehemently uh, anti-communist, and she was all about fighting for Mother Russia, her country. So, uh, well, what happened to Maria and the Women's Battalion of Death? Well, we're going to have to save that for another video, which I'd like to have a whole video dedicated to really covering this more in depth. But hopefully I've piqued your interest, because this is a really uh, important woman and an important, and but yet, unfortunately, kind of forgotten part of World War I history. But why are we talking about this today? Well, it's interesting, if you look at the pictures of these women that enlisted in the Women's Battalion of Death, that's right, they're wielding mosin Nagant Dragoon rifles, just like this guy, with the bayonets affixed. Why? Okay. Well, there's a couple of theories here. Uh, one was that they just got provided a bunch of training rifles, and that's what they had was just training. The training rifles they were provided happened to be Dragoon rifles. It seems like a couple rifles... And if you look closely in this picture, may not actually have a recoil lug in the stock, which means they're sort of older and they may have just been sitting around somewhere, weren't getting used, and they never had that update. Could be? So that's one possible theory. Another theory is that, well, a lot of these women probably weren't all that tall. And so if you took an M91 rifle with a bayonet, it would probably be... A, I don't know, six inches to maybe even a foot taller than they were. Maybe not a foot taller, but certainly a lot taller than they were. Just a massive rifle, way too big to really, as way too big, a lot bigger than they needed to be is basically what I'm trying to say here. Seems very logical to me that you would want to give them something a little bit shorter, uh, like a Dragoon rifle right here, okay? Now, why wouldn't you give him something like a 1907 carbine rifle? 
Well, that's another good question. Couple reasons. One is supply. They probably didn't have a lot of those to spare um, because they're specifically trying to give those to troops that weren't really frontline units. Because remember, the bayonet charge is still a big doctrine of the Russian Empire. Those didn't have bayonets. They're more for like people in machine gun squads and artillery squads, things like that, perhaps. The Women's Battalion of Death wasn't anything like that. The whole idea of this was that the Women's Battalion of Death was actually going to go on the front lines and lead the men head on in charges against the enemy, essentially, in offensives. The women are going to go in and, the, I mean, if you think about this, it kind of, it sounds weird, but I guess it kind of makes sense because if you think about it, in those days, it's really taboo to have women on the front lines of battle. So if you're a bunch of men sitting around on the battlefield saying, ah, you know, I don't really want to go out and fight, you know, this war is a waste of time. Well, if all of a sudden you see a whole battalion of a bunch of uh, women with Mosins like this, just, just straight up go over the top and charge the enemy, what are you going to think? I don't know. You're probably going to, you're probably going to be a little embarrassed that you're a man sitting around and the women are now fighting doing the fighting that you're supposed to be doing so maybe that was what they were thinking of but also it, so that's one aspect but also just the courage of these women right we're not saying that women can't be courageous they definitely would have displayed a lot of courage because let's face it a lot of these parts of the battlefield the men aren't displaying courage they're just sitting in their trenches saying oh i don't want to go work so if you got women out there displaying all this courage saying, you know, in spite of all of the negative morale around, we're going to go take it to the Germans. Yeah, I would have thought twice about not fighting, probably. So that's that was the idea with these rifles, I think, is you needed rifles with bayonets because you're going to be doing frontline front line infantry. And that's the standard doctrine is bayonet charges. That's like the mainstay of the Russian infantry. So if you want... A rifle with a bayonet but a little bit more compact this is really your only option uh, as far as Mosins go in World War One so that's probably another good reason why we see these women with Dragoon rifles okay we've talked a lot about some interesting things let's recap we've got around World War One we've got railway workers with Dragoon rifles we obviously have Dragoon troops with these doing anything from cavalry charges to actual just standard infantry shooting with these rifles to, uh, you know, conducting nefarious operations and clandestine operations behind enemy lines to uh, sabotage telegraph lines, barbed wire, things like that. We've got uh, sailors in the Russian Navy in the Mediterranean Sea assisting at Gallipoli with Mosins. And we've got women leading the front charge, the battlefield against the Germans with Dragoon rifles. This is not at all a whole complete list of people who used Dragoon rifles in World War I, but we're trying to get through a lot here in a week, folks. So I wanted to hit some of the highlights and just some interesting things that you may not have looked at or may not have thought of before. So I really hope you found a lot of this information interesting. If you're interested in learning more about Mosin Nagants, or, or if you're interested in learning more about the Women's Battalion of Death, which hopefully you are, make sure to subscribe and share this video. Now, I think what we want to do is take a look at this Dragoon Rifle, because again, we've got another neat Dragoon Rifle here. So let's see exactly what it is we've got, because you've been looking at it for this whole entirety of the video, but let's look at some of the markings now. Alrighty, folks, let's see what we got here today. We start at the back here, we can see remnants of the original cartouche. We can sort of see it. And that looks like a, um, a proof mark from the factory, that, or an acceptance marking, that kind of tells me this is a newer stock. This is probably not from World War I. This might even be a 9130 stock from maybe the 1930s or something. Just a guess for now. Uh, we've got our 
early style escutcheons right here with the two screws in it. And we look on the back here, and you know, it's on a rifle like this, it's hard to tell. It can be hard to tell if the butt plate is original, but if that's anything to go by, this is post-1928 Ijevsk factory marking right there. So that kind of would indicate that this is a stock that we kind of thought it was, maybe from the late 20s, early 30s. But the gun isn't from that era, though. Let's take a closer look at the barrel markings now. All right, so as we can see, we've got another Ijevsk rifle. We have our Imperial Crest right here on the receiver. We've got our Ijevsk bow and arrow right there, and we can see that this rifle was produced in 1903. So this is cool. And we see here we have our D. Of course, this one was used by Finland also. Gotta love Finnish Mosins, folks. Now, why is this one interesting? Why is 1903 an interesting year? Well, a couple reasons. Now, number one, 1903 is cool because from our records, we know that the Ijez factory only produced about 10,000 of these rifles in 1903. That is not very many rifles. These didn't don't have a great survival rate, so these are this is not by any stretch of the imagination a common rifle. So I'm really excited to bring it to y'all folks. 1903 is also an interesting year because here's another little known fact. Um, if in 1903, this is actually the last year that we have the most detailed records from the Ijez factory. Okay, up to 1903. We have information on the specific production numbers per models of rifles made by the Ujevs factory. So in 1903, we know how many M91 rifles they made, how many uh, Dragoon rifles they made, and how many Caustic rifles they made. Uh, now, we basically know that from all the way up until 1903, but starting in 1904, the records that at least I have we no longer understand how many Dragoon rifles versus like M91 rifles were produced in a year. So starting in 1904, we just have a single number telling us how many rifles the Ijez factory made that year. But we don't know how many specifically uh, were like, we don't know the breakdown between the different types of models production number wise for each year. So that's why these are a little bit cooler because we actually know approximately how many they made. Whereas after this, we don't necessarily have that great of an idea, just a ballpark guesstimate. So that's one of the reasons I really like pre-1904 Ijevsk rifles. Not just the Dragoons, but all of them, because you, you have a much better breakdown of the actual production numbers. Remember, this is really only for, for now at least, the Ijevsk factory, because they're the only factory making uh, Mosin rifles other than the M91 rifle. Alright, so now let's take a look at our rear sight again. And just like we typically see with these finished rifles, we have our sight graduations going from 200 meters, and we can see they did cut that extra notch in the sight base. That's very common. Up to about 850 meters. That is optimistic. We have our early style handguard with the brass tabs and rivets. We do have our Dragoon style barrel bands. We can see we have our Ijevsk bow and arrow there. We've got our Ijevsk triangle there. We've got a very angry hummingbird just over there. We've got another Ijevsk triangle here and I think that's remnants of an Ijevsk bow and arrow right there. Now this actually gets really interesting when we get up here because because if you take a look at this cleaning rod, this is not your standard cleaning rod. This is actually an M39 pattern cleaning rod that has been, uh, that has, a, this, this is a different length, I believe though. This is actually a 9130 length or a Dragoon rifle because they're basically the same length. So this is a, kind of an uncommon thing to see. This is probably much later this was probably made in the 1940s or even later than that. 
but this is not a type of cleaning rod you see super often. You have this massive head with this huge hole going through it. Typically we just see the, uh, the standard ones that we've seen in our earlier videos. We also see here we've got our Imo Lati front sight with a notch here at the back that's taller. And if we turn this rascal around a little bit, we can see that this one's actually not counterboard. That's pretty interesting. It's got a really nice crown to it. So this guy is, what well, the time of this video, how old are you? Let's see, so 1903. Uh, I gotta do maths, and maths is hard. 119 years old? That's pretty old, and for a 119-year-old Mosin, this guy is in really good shape. But if I turn this guy around, he gets more interesting, because if we take a look here at the rear sight based on the other side, look at that. Just like the last one, no markings here except our Ijez factory marking. So remember in 1903, this guy would have originally had that flat rear sight we looked at in our first video of Dragoon Week. And it would have had that handguard that wrapped all the way around with the numbers carved into the side of it. So they didn't originally put the numbers on the sight base and they were never re-stamped, which doesn't surprise me because this rifle has not been used a whole lot, which is really incredible given how old it is. Uh, also, this one doesn't appear to have any import markings. Now, when we talk about Dragoons, it's actually pretty uncommon to find any Dragoon, at least here in America, with import markings. Why is that? Well, maybe we'll have to talk about that another time, but it's one thing to keep in mind here. And I believe all of the, right, the Dragoons we've looked at so far, none of them have had import markings. And this guy is no different. Really fascinating. We've got a three here, which I believe that is a inspector's marking of the Ejevs factory. Sometimes you'll see a three on the tang on the underside of the receiver right next to the date on early Ejevs rifles. You also get a K there. Just overall, this is a gorgeous rifle. Really pretty. And you know, we've looked at a lot of cool use cases for these rifles just so far. Who knows where this rifle has been, folks? If only it could talk. We don't know who used it, but we know, like, a person with an actual name actually used this and wielded this rifle. So we don't know who it was, but you know what? I like to try to cover all the bases to help honor whoever it was that used this, because at least we can recognize who they were and what they did. But overall, just a really, really cool rifle. And I hope by now I'm starting to get y'all interested in these Dragoon rifles. Absolutely gorgeous, folks. So again, if you guys haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. All we do is Mosin Nagant content and maybe some interesting derivatives of it. We just love these rifles here, and I hope you all do as well, and learning about the interesting and important history behind them. So thank you guys for watching. Let me know if you all got any prayer requests, and we'll see you next time.